Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Year of Jacob of Sarug, an online series of lectures on the writings and theology of the Bishop of Batnan to celebrate the 15th anniversary of his death. I greet you from Washington, D.C. I am Armando El Khoury. Robert Kitchen, the, the co-organizer of the Year of Jacob of Saru, and I are glad that you are able to join us on Zoom today to celebrate Jacob. We also greet and welcome our live viewers on the YouTube channel of the Merit Eparchy of Los Angeles and on Urho the Way. Before I pass the mic to Robert, who will give homage to Paul Peters and Stephen Ring, who have recently passed away, I want to thank our guest speaker, Muriel Dubier, for her paper entitled Jacob of Sarug in His Time, a Preacher in Late Antique Mesopotamia. And also would like to thank Jeff Wicks, who agreed to present our speaker. And gratitude is also due to our to my bishop, His Excellency Elias Zaiden, for sponsoring this online conference. The logistics of this, of managing this talk. You may direct your questions to today's speaker only at the end of her talk. To do so, click on the reactions icon under the video feed. When the small pop-up window opens up, click on raise hand. I will call on you in the order I see on my screen and I will request that you unmute yourself. Once unmuted, you may ask your question. Thank you again for joining us. And here is Robert Kitchen. Okay. Last time we met, uh, we had a had to remember two of our uh, colleagues uh, who had passed away in the past uh, in the past few weeks. Uh, we did not expect that we'd have to do this again, but it is fitting that we recognize people who have been part of our community. In the past few weeks, Stephen Ring uh, passed away uh, quite suddenly um, and unexpectedly. Uh, he was originally uh, an electronic and communications engineer, but somewhere in the late 90s, he, he got a hold of Syriac and started uh, studying it, particularly in London at the School of Oriental and African Studies. Uh, his, he finally finished and defended his thesis, the post fifth century trajectory of the Syriac Diatessaron and perspectives on the origins of the Diatessaron just shortly before his, his death. Uh, he was part of our uh, and he's participated in all three of our lectures up to this point. And so we uh, are sad to, uh, to lose him and for his work, particularly on the Syriac sections of the Dea Tesseron. Paul Paters uh, is also quite unexpectedly uh, passed away in uh, Louvain, Leuven, uh, Belgium. He was a member of the founding family uh, of Paters uh, Publishing and indeed was the uh, executive director. He was not a, uh, a scholar per se, but anyone in Syriac who attended really any one of the major conferences, the Society of Biblical Literature, the Oxford Patristics, Symposium, Syriacum, and many others would remember meeting and talking with him. He was always friendly and he was maybe not rare, but he was definitely distinguished by his support and encouragement of the Syriac field faithfully throughout these, these years. May indeed both of them rest in peace and we remember their contributions gratefully. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob. It is now my great honor to introduce our our speaker, Professor Marielle Debye. Professor Debye is Professor of Eastern Christian Studies at École Pratique des Hautes Etudes at the Sorbonne. 
a senior member of the Institut Universitaire de France. She has held fellowships at the Institut for Advanced Study at Princeton, the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World at NYU, and is part of an IRIS grant for the program Scripta Histoire et Pratique de l'Écrit. Professor Debier is engaged in a wide range of editing activities. He's the co-founder and director of the series Bibliothèque de l'Orient Chrétien, as well as the co-founder and director of the series Etudes Syriac. Professor Debier is most well known for her publications, which are not only numerous, but also display a depth of historical learning, imagination, insight, and erudition. Setting aside her many articles and edited books, I will merely highlight two of her three monographs. Her second book, La Créature de l'Histoire in Syriac, was published with Brill in 2015. This book has been foundational in understanding historiography from a uniquely Syriac perspective. Through the lens of Syriac histori historiographical narratives and narrators, the work engages questions about Syriac literary history writ large, and comparatively, the methods of writing history in the pre-modern period. Her third and most recent book, Le Monde Syriac, co-authored with Francois Briquel Chaponnet, was published in 2018 and is currently being translated into English for publication with Yale University Press. This book, drawing on literary texts as well as material history, offers an indispensable guide to the Syriac tradition as it emerged chronologically from the second to the 13th century and geographically from Byzantium to India and China. With all of this in mind, it is our great honor today to have Professor Debier turn her attention to Jacob of Sarug in his time, a preacher in late antique Mesopotamia. Professor Debier, welcome. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, for your detailed and unduly positive introduction. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for this series of conferences that celebrate the year of Jacob of Sarug and for inviting me, although I'm a newcomer in Jacobean studies. This celebration comes aptly after the revelation of 160 new homilies recently published by Ruji Akras and Imad Siriani, to whom we are greatly indebted for making available a considerable addition to the existing corpus that we have just started to assess. I will share the screen in order to um, show you the addition. Uh, not the screen I wanted, sorry. Here it is. Yes, supposed to go to the next slide. It's not the case. Never mind. Uh, I, I wanted to show you the edition. And to show you what a manuscript of uh, Jacob's homilies actually uh, look like. Had Jacob written in Greek or Latin and had been a member of the Catholic or Orthodox churches, that edition would have made the headlines of newspapers, well, of the cultural pages of some newspapers. But this event remained uh, confined to the happy few who are aware of Jacob's art through poetry and exegetical skills. So let us rejoice then of this uh, confidential uh, breakthrough. Pending the awaited edition of Jacob's uh, biography copied in the manuscript of Mardin, that is supposed to be the only true biography according to our fathers, we have to rely on notices and panegyrics. They agree in presenting in the hagiographic mode the exceptional gift of Jacob as a preacher and writer that the Holy Spirit supposed, supposedly bestowed upon him. I quote from one of his short biographies what I found a significant passage 
for understanding what image of Jacob was construed in these memorial hagiographies. At the young age of three, Jacob escaped his mother's arms and walked to the sanctuary under the gaze of the whole congregation. I quote, he stretched out his hands and drank three handfuls like Ezekiel eating from the scroll. And from that moment, the spirit of the Lord alighted upon him and he began to utter discourse that was out of the norm. This passage tell, tells us in the form of a typical hagiographic tale, how Jacob stood as an intermediary between God and the faithful, their lay people in the church, both part of the congregation and apart from it in his role as an instrument for words and sounds from above, within and around. It stresses his gift from a young age and his unique and outstanding position as a preacher. This passage also establishes a link between the, the written, Ezekiel's scroll, and the spoken word, an articulation to which I will come back later. This hagiographic expression of Jacob's role resounds with what the ancient chronicles also say. It constitutes the collective memory of Jacob that was transmitted through time until today, reenacted orally in the liturgy, based on Boaoso woven from his memory, and visible in the beautiful and mammoth manuscripts that contains his works. And that is the image that you are not seeing right now, but that I wanted to show you. It is on Jacob as a preacher, but I would like to focus today from a historical as well as a more exeg exegetical point of view. I would like first to gather what information we have about his training and his activity as a preacher against the background of contemporary history. The premia of his memory, in turn, give a lyric interpretation of the way Jacob himself envisioned his role as a preacher. They also say something about his craftsmanship and how we can understand the articulation of the written and the spoken word, word with and without a capital. Jacob's reputation in his own time far exceeds what was his official position. He was most of his life a mere periodotes, an ecclesiastical visitor, meaning that he was under the authority of a bishop, probably the Bishop of Seru, to whom he ultimately succeeded at a late age. The visitors had no authority, but that from the bishop who sent them to monasteries or small cities and villages in the countryside. Jacob does not seem to have had even the rank of for Episcopos or Bishop of the Korah, the countryside. Since the fourth century, for Episcopal tended to lose their independence and acted as periodotes, but still they had a superior rank. Periodotes came third in the ecclesiastical hierarchy of the bishoprics. In Syria, fewer uh, corepiscopoi than periodotes are attested in the inscriptions. And the canon 57 of the Council of Laodicea in the fourth century attest that periodotes replaced corepiscopoi in the villages, although corepiscopoi did not disappear. The periodotes played an important role in the life of the church outside the, the cathedral cities, as the mentioned the gods in mosaic pavements of rural churches exemplify. Periodotes were clerics. Some were not even priests, assisting the bishop of a city in his administration of the church in his diocese. Yet, Jacob was far more famous than the bishop of Seru on whom he depended. He became so well known that he was even mentioned in chronicles, whereas the name of the bishop or bishops to whom he was attached did not make its way to posterity. 
we know that Severus Sebort in the seventh century wrote a letter to a Periodotes, Yonan, about our Aristotelic philosophy. But no other Periodotes than Jacob is known for his writing. He was an authoritative figure in his own right, although he did not have, until very late in his life, the position of authority in, in the church. The artistry of his homilies explain, of course, why he became so famous. But he was also more present in the life of a local church than most bishops since he toured the Diocese of Seru. We should first picture him as an itinerant monk and priest who preached in front of different audiences according to where he was sent by his bishop. And contrary to bishops who preached mostly in the city of Essi, we have little information about the places where Jacob preached, except for the three years he spent as Bishop of Seru. It means that the intertextuality in his memory, weaving echoes between them, was probably lost to his audiences, which were not the same each time he preached. They were more likely the result of his own mode of composition based on memory an artful combination of formulaic phraseology that Manolis Papoutsakis has identified as one of Jacob's poetic tools. Susan Harvey ha has drawn a vivid picture of what we can glean from his memory about his audience. Jacob not only delivered speeches on the Bible, the feasts of the church of the holy man, but he also, he also made memory about local life and events. He wrote about the locusts that ravaged uh, crops, just as Severus of Antioch, who wrote poems on them. Like the poems attributed to Ephraim, he composed memory of praise at the table, some probably set during the banquets after the harvest of crops or fruit, from what we can gather from the content. He wrote also against the spectacles of the theater that the faithful attended, and he spoke during sense commemorations. He might even have traveled to the monastery of Simeon the Stylite and made there his speech on Simeon, if a mention, I quote, let us written then to the pillar, which is right here, is a reference to the actual pillar and not just a rhetorical posture. But his influence went even far beyond the boundaries of his jurisdiction and his official position. It reached wide and far. We have kept only 43 letters from him, which is not much in comparison with the number of memory. But they depict how his network extending, extended from individuals like monks and nuns, but also accounts, to heads and communities of monasteries or bishops not only in northern Mesopotamia, but all the way to Sinai and to Najran. Philip Fornes highlighted in his book the historical context that these letters provide for the engagement of Jacob in Christological debates and preaching. The letters and memory also present a unique insight of Jacob's involvement in the context of Roman-Persian relations, not only during wars, but also in the more ordinary basis of the life of the churches. During the Anastasian War, he wrote a letter to the bishop or to a priest of Edessa, we do not know because the heading of the letter is lost, reminding him of God's unbreachable promise to protect Abgar's city and exhorting him to encourage the inhabitants who stayed in spite of the, Pers of the Persian threats. He also wrote two memory on the capture of Amida at a time when the city was without a bishop since he died at the beginning of the war. But aside from these special circumstances, Jacob also answers the letter of Orthodox Christians of Arzun, a, a stronghold in Persia. He says that the letter was brought to him secretly by a priest who crossed the border like a merchant and brought the news of the attempts to Nestorianize the Orthodox community there. Jacob asserts that all the seats in the Roman Empire openly condemned Nestorius, 
and he sends an orthodox profession of faith to his addresses. He also speaks about the Mariology of Nestorius in his discussion of the hypostasis of Christ. So several of Jacob's writings actually show the importance of Mariological questions in the controversies with the Diophysites in Iran, the letter to the Blessed of Arzun, of which I just spoke, and also the letter to the Bishop of Dara, another stronghold at the border of the Roman Empire, fortified by Anastasius in 505, which gives a prominent uh, postquem for this letter, in which Jacob urges the bishop to build a spiritual role for his flock, similar to the physical roles against the Persian enemies, because of the vicinity of the Nestorian. And he sends him as a weapon, a beautiful mariological development on the Virgin as a sealed door. Mariology features here too, as a major subject of discussion. The Nimro and the Dormition of the Virgin is another instance of those discussions with the Nestorians. It is the only one for which we have a precise setting. The title of this Nimro says that it is the 81st Festal Homily of Jacob and is about the departure and burial of the Virgin Mary, the Theotokos, highlighting thus the title that was the contentious issue with the Nestorians. It goes on saying that Jacob spoke this name rule when there was an inquiry about the Dormition during a synod, meet, a synod meeting in the church of Mar Syriacus Martyr in the city of Nisibis on a Wednesday, the 14th of Av. This was in fact the date of the celebration of the Feast of the Dormition as the content of the mural shows. I'm afraid you will have to wait for Charles Naffa to finish his PhD, PhD on the six book, books of um, Life of a Virgin to know more about the Dormition and its uh, celebration. I will not uh, elaborate on this topic here. But the information provided by this title is both tantalizing and frustrating since the year of the event is not mentioned, neither the exact circumstances. Nonetheless, this short introduction gives interesting information. It informs us about the name of a church in Nisibis dedicated to the uh, Kyriakos or Martyr, better known as Judas Kyriakos. It informs us about the celebration of the Dormition, the 14th of Av. And of course, we would like to know more about this synod in the Persian Empire one of the local ones that took place every two years in each province and not one of the great councils of the church. We have to keep in mind that the final years of the fifth century saw the influence of Barsoma of Nisibis, who was a propagandist of Diophysite Christology in the Persian Empire and may have founded the school of Nisibis. The city was thus the hotbed of Diophysite Christology at the time of Jacob. And it was during this synod that Jacob preached a distinctly myophysite view of the departure of a virgin as a kind of counter propaganda. Since he delivered his memory in a church of a city, we should assume that it was a church in the hands of a myophysite um, congregation, which is also an important um, information. And it mentions strikingly that Jacob spoke in his edict. Jacob mentioned in his letter to the Christian of Arzun that priest Lazarus overcame dangers and braved the fear of the enemies in order to deliver the letter secretly. To which suppose that the same was true for Jacob, did he exaggerate the dangers, of his, the dangers for passing uh, his letter to the Roman Empire? Or did he get safe conduct for an uh, as an ecclesiastical figure in order to cross the border? Was it different in Nisibis? because it was one of the official markets and crossing point uh, on the border, we have no means in an, uh, to answer this question. All we can suggest is that since there was no bishop for the Orthodox in Nisibis, Jacob went as an itinerant authority coming from the nearby region of Edessa. With a terminus antequem in 5 to 1, when Jacob died, this text poses more problems than it gives answers. Yet it sheds some light on the practical conditions of the controversies across the Roman Persian border. This text offers also a few glimpses of the frustrating in the elusiveness 
of Jacob's engagement in the, in the Christological controversies with the Nestorians across her, bo her border, especially um, it gives information about the place of Marology or arguments in the discussions dealing with Christ's natures. It should not come as a surprise, but we generally tend to downplay this aspect when we deal with Christological issues. The matter was not confined to the aftermath of the Council of Ephesus. It is, it is significant, for instance, that when the school of the Persians in Edessa was closed because of its diophysite leaning, Simeon of Beitarshan, a Mayaphysite known as the Persian debater, debater, says in his letter that it was uprooted and it, it, its place the temple in the name of Our Lady Mary the Theotokos was built. I would like to turn now to the question of uh, Christological discussions from another angle, that of Jacob's education and formation. I want to add to the picture information that has been well known and yet has not fully been considered uh, so far when one comes to the intellectual life in Edessa, the use of languages or questions of ethnic and religious identities, or when discussing Marseille, Jacob and Philoxenus, who thought or studied there. You all know the passage in the letter to the monks of Morbassus, in which Jacob says that 45 years ago, I quote, when I was studying the readings of the divine scriptures in the city of Edessa, and at the very time the books of the wicked Diodor were being translated from Greek into Syriac, and there was in the, in the city a school of the Persians who held the teaching of the foolish Diodor with, with much love. And by that school, all the East was harmed. This school, by the diligence of him who is worthy of good memory, Morkua, Bishop of, of Edessa, and by the command of the faithful Emperor Zeno was uprooted from the city. Then, at the same time that those wicked books were being translated from Greek to Syriac, I was as a child who is in need of learning. I came across one of these books of Theodore and I found it full of all ambiguities and all thoughts which are quite far from the truth. That would have taken place in the 460s or 470s about the time when Philoxenus came to Edessa and Narsai left and went to Nisibi. The school was closed in 489. It is usually assumed that in spite of this clear condemnation of the works of the Antiochian, uh, Antiochian writers, Jacob attended that school and perhaps even attended Narsai's classes. He speaks, however, of the school in this passage in a distant way, not as if he had been part of it. And that may well be the case if we remember that three schools actually existed in Edessa in the mid fifth century, as the acts of the robust Synod of Ephesus state. The Synod took place in 449. The acts that de describe the city's various complaints against Ibas and mentioned that one of the various acclamations made against him was signed by citizens from the city of Edessa. I quote the acts. They said they, they subscribed to it. All the clergy and the heads of monasteries, monks and Nikiana, worthies and citizens and Romans, and the schools of the Armenians, of the Persians, and of the Syrians, and the artisans and the whole city. Adam Becker, in his book, The Fear of God, has pieced together all the available information about the schools. Yet the existence of these three schools is seldom acknowledged in Arthur's studies. It is true that we know next to nothing about the other two schools, but the existence is meaningful in itself. We can guess that they were meant to accommodate students for, of other nations and uh, languages. The existence of a school of the Utoye in Amida, which is mentioned by John of Ephesus, because it was destroyed by the Persians during the siege of a city in 502-503, Backed by a monastery of the Otoye. The Otoye came from the province of uh, Anzuten, a region east of Amida at the border um, with Armenia. 
seems to confirm that these schools were meant for national from other regions or uh, countries. If we extrapolate from what we know from the canons of the School of Nisibis, they probably work as some sort of boarding schools for students coming from far away, um, backed, of course, by monasteries where they would stay. Just as in Paris in the Middle Ages, there were, for example, the College of the, the Irish, or the College of the Scots, for those who came to study at the Sorbonne. Marcel taught at the School of the Persians, and Philoxenus might have studied there too, since he came from Persia, from uh, the region of Petgarmai. But in all likelihood, Jacob attended the School of the Suryoye. The way he speaks of a school of the Persians points in the same direction. It is neither the school of the Persian, as if it were the only one, neither our school. The school of the Armenians is almost never mentioned in the studies about the Armenians who studied in Syrian regions. And I will not discuss that uh, here because it's not, um, it's not the place. Um, but the existence of, of, of a school is very important uh, for the relations between uh, Armenian and Syrians uh, at that time. Apart from the fact that the language of teaching in the schools was probably Syriac, we do not know anything about the curriculum. We know from Jacob's uh, works that he read Ephraim and wrote a memoir on him, on his life. He read Theodore of Mortuestia too, as the images of divine pedagogy he uses exemplify. And I will shortly turn to that. Yet he makes a different use of Theodore than Narsai, for instance. The similarities and differences between Jacob and Narsai have been often noted and more comparative work is yet to be done, keeping in mind the possible different training in those two schools, and yet a common access to the books available in the DESA. Each student, for instance, of each school had access to the books kept, copied, and studied in the upper school. From what Philoxenus, as well as Jacob, say, they both read the text of the Antiochian father, only to reject them, and put the blame on their young age. If the Antiochians were not part of the curriculum of the School of the Suryoye, as is likely, she can manage to get hold of them anyway. Manuscripts were rare, and he read them because they were available in the city at that time for translation. That means that he borrowed them from a fellow student or a teacher, perhaps from the School of the Persians. The example of Patriarch Timotheus, in, 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 much later on, an East Syrian who tried to obtain books from Marmatai, a Syrian Orthodox monastery, shows, however, that it was not always uh, successful and easy. But since the manuscript of a Pshita dated 599, there's a colophon saying that it was collated on the manuscript of the book of the school of the Armenians. We can infer that the books kept in the school were used by outsiders. There's not much more that we can say about the three schools, since the school of the Persians was the only one that received some light because of its problematic theological position. But their existence suggests a more complex picture than the one generally envisioned. It suggests a national or ethnic uh, level in addition to the confessional one. Jacob's own testimony also allows the possibility of a more flexible exchange of books and ideas and the controversies and condemnations entail. As we will see now, Jacob had much in common with Theodor Murksuestia, the interpreter par excellence and the column of the Church of the East in his conception of man as God's image and of divine pedagogy. But it doesn't mean that Jacob had to learn about Theodore as a student at the School of the Persians. I would like to turn in this final part to the poemia of Jacob's memory that display his own understanding of his role as a preacher and his conception of divine pedagogy which he shares with the Antiochian fathers and yet conceptualizes differently. 
The poemia are striking by their distinctiveness, beauty, and strength. They reveal a theology of a word, logos, melpo, that encapsulates Jacob's activity as a preacher, associating the body and the intellect. They play with a common idea set in different verbal garments that are adapted to the subject of each memo, and they contain many theological rhetorical formulas that can be traced as echoes in the various poemia. As Schiffer su suggested last time, they may be understood as part of a liturgical ritual, as a way of providing the audience with words they were familiar with. And they function indeed as a musical introduction that captures the audience's attention. Jacob was trained as a Christian rapper and does not ignore any of the means of a cartaccio benevolentia. In the middle of the liturgy, as Susan Harvey pointed out, after the liturgy of the word and before the liturgy of the fetu, Jacob had to gather attention to the bema on which he stood and concentrate attention to his words. Like the words once upon a time opened the door of fairy, fairy tale, similarly, Jacob's invocation opened the door of the memo and the door to God, an image that he employs also frequently when invoking God's inspiration. The poemia are replete with mention of the word, word with and without capital again. The word with capital, Christ, descended on earth, and the words that Jacob demands from God for his audience, and words of his audience giving praises in return. The words are associated with sound and even music, implying the physical dimension of, of the senses. Jacob considered the senses to be 10, the five external senses, which are the door to the five internal ones. The sense of hearing plays a particular role to the ear, to the ear Eve was fooled by the words of a serpent, and through the ear, Mary conceived the word Christ. The physical dimension is fully involved in the relation between human beings and God in Jacob's view. The mirror on the dormition of a virgin displays a rich image of a mingling of a sense of hearing and the word. As a tribute to Mary Hansbury, who has recently left us, I will quote Jacob from her translation that she gathered in a nice little uh, booklet full of treasures. I quote, Lord of all, let my let my heart be stirred up by you for, our, for your glory, for because of you, whoever is eager is able to speak to you. My Lord, generate for me sounds and words, even music, that my mouth may speak about you profusely. My tongue will be your pen, a scribe full of wisdom, and with it will lovingly show forth your discourse to be heard. And later he says, son, who firmly fixed ten mortal, mortal senses in the mortal body, play my force and bring them to the place of your father. Through the image of a flute, by which Jacob was later known as the flute of a, the flute of a spirit, of a harp that God plays with his fingers, Jacob expresses a metaphysic that, he, that is Aristotelian in essence. God is the principle that moves the world without moving himself. Jacob, as a human microcosm, experiences as a preacher the impulse that God through the spirit creates in him. He presents himself as an instrument, an image that is also underlying the odes of Solomon. Receiving inspiration both intellectually and physically as a poet, through whom the poem unveils itself as a recipient of divine inspiration, as an intermediary between God and human beings, interpreting both scriptures and nature, as a vessel for emotions, transcribing the emotions of a faithful. The image of a poem speaking for him cannot but remind us of modern semiotics theory about the generation of text. 
I, I quote from the memo on the nativity of our uh, Redeemer. I am giving the half of my words to you and let me borrow your finger. By the impulse of a spirit, let my mind bring forth the homily of your praise because I am not capable of your homily. Please speak for me. I am the flute when your word is breath and your story is the voice. Please take control of it and by your means, may we sing to you using what is your, what is your own. Since your, birth, since your first birth is concealed even from the watchers, make me worthy to sing out from the latter one, from the daughter of David. This passage concentrates several elements of Jacob's thought, but we find scattered in most of his poems. Jacob shares here with Ephraim the idea that God is ontologically separated from humanity and is concealed in silence. Even her spiritual being cannot to speak about him. With Theodor of Moxuestia and the Antiochian school, he shares the idea that God made himself known for man, created as his image. The importance of his idea of image is set all in Jacob's thought. It is because man is the image of God that it is possible to know God. As for a friend, nature and scriptures are the bridges between God, who is unknowable, and man's intellect. For Jacob, nature is not as important as it is for Ephraim. But the story told by God's, disp by God's dispensation is for him the condition for bri bridging, at least partially, the ontological past. He cannot speak about Christ, son, um, sorry, he, he cannot speak about Christ, son of God, his first birth, but he can speak of his second birth when Christ mingled with nature, when, I quote, you were hidden in your father and he revealed you in Adam when he created him, he depicted in him the likeliness of your bodily existence and your revelation. It is the creation of man in God's image and the incarnation that brought God in, unto man that enables humans to speak about God. And that is why it is in memory about Christ's nativity and about the Virgin, but this idea is most powerfully evoked by Jacob. I quote again from uh, the memo um, on Tamar, from your father, the whole of your story has come close to us and love has united you in lineage with us that we may sing praises to you. You became one of us while, while you are our law, and anyone who seeks to speak your story is entitled to do so. In this spring and of a memo on the nativity, it's a memo on nativity, sorry. Jacob explains how the incarnation of the world enabled human beings to speak words about the, about the divinity, bridging somehow the gap between the divine and human being through words. And the metaphysic of the Logos, Melto, underlines this conception. I quote, awake with a discernment intelligence in order to speak. For in the dust, this is a way of uh, uh, speaking about Adam. For in the dust, he imprisoned his word in order to convert it. I did not dare ascend to the essence that is invisible to all. I compose in an Adamic way this treaty full of wonder. This is from the Korean of the second memo about uh, uh, creation. The word in, um, imprisoned in dust is a powerful image for understanding the depth of Jacob's conception. The word of the homily is possible because from the beginning, God imbued it into Adam, both corporal and spiritual, mortal and immortal, and renewed it when he sent his own word, Christ, to partake of humanity. God, God is thus the first speaker and spoke in the scriptures to Moses, the scribe, and to Jacob, who wrote a memo about God. He is also the first teacher that teaches humanity a lesson. 
the memo on the Tower of Babel, the image is that of a school, schoolmaster who strikes the students, humanity, whom he instructs, an image that Jacob probably got from his own school experience. To stay in this more concrete image of teaching, Jacob always urges his audience to find the rose in the middle of the forms, honey in, in bitterness, to be attentive to the sweetness of teaching in, in his memory, as well as in the Bible, where even the terrible story of Tamar brings fruit. And so he tries to convince his audience of the fruitfulness of the memory. The powerful conception of the word as the incorporated divine intelligence in human beings as images of God should help us assess better the high conception of preaching and teaching that was Jacob's. God made himself known to humanity through his story, and this is a word that Jacob uses a, a lot, shabbo, as taught in the Bible, as well as through the story of a virgin or the story of a saint. That story is made of symbols to decipher and words that anyone, and Jacob in the first place, can use to retell it and interpret it. In conclusion, these invoca invocations probably worked too as a way of weaving together the several threads of his position as a preacher. Physically, since he stood on the Bema, at the crossroads of a sanctuary and the name, and the name where the faithful were gathered, the words of the Nimro tied together the vertical and horizontal dimensions between God and the preacher, and the preacher and his audience. Symbolically, since he delivered his speech between the liturgy of the word and the communion, he invokes the word of God that enables the Nimro between the story of God spoken in the Bible and the story of Christ in his economy. In a more practical way, these invocations that Jacob adapts with artistic lyricism to the subject of each memo worked as a kind of warming up for him while he pulled together the strings of a memo from God to the preacher and from the preacher to the audience with a return on high to praises and songs. A more in-depth in analysis of the, ver of the verses would show how the formulaic phraseology uh, Jacob used were useful in order for him to enter in the, pro in the creative process of the memo as words that he could easily piece together from memory, especially since some of his memory at least were probably extemporized. We may think of them as ritual compositions from a treasure chest of words to take over an image that Jacob himself uses when he asks God to give him words from the treasure of his scripture or from nature. More research is needed on the importance of a story and the word in Jacob's creation process, but I will stop here in order that you do not die of boredom and restlessness in front of your, of your screen, especially since I'm afraid that you may not find in the, even the tiniest of rose buds from my ugly talk to speak in Jacobian terms. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Um, I love, I love the image that he gives that he is the uh, an instrument and God uses him to play his music and uh, how he sees himself as uh, God's spokesperson and God imbued in him that gift and he's using it uh, for preaching. Um, does he see himself um, as such because he's an ordained minister, do you think? Or does he see himself as such as somebody whom God can speak through uh, because he's a Christian. Uh, in your opinion, um, what do you think? It's probably because he is a human being and because from the very beginning, during the act of creation of man uh, itself, God actually, uh, as the image of the, 
of the dust uh, shows uh, in, imbued a man, uh, human beings with, um, with a word. And, and so it enables Jacob uh, to um, uh, not only ask for words, but also uh, find words um, in, in himself. And, and words as means of um, understanding God who is otherwise unknowable. So it has a very, uh, very powerful meaning for him. Okay. Thank so you very much. To have access to the, um, the intellect uh, with a capital to, to, to God himself. Thank you. Uh, we open it now for questions. Uh, just a reminder, if you'd like to ask, ask, ask a question, uh, please click on the reactions icon and the video feed, uh, and then click on raise hand, and I will call on you in the order I see on my screen. I would request that you unmute yourself, and once you are unmuted, you may ask your question. Jeff. Thank you, Muriel, for this uh, really wonderful, interesting uh, talk. So much detail and insight um, situating Jacob in so many different contexts. Uh, first a comment and then a, um, a question. The comment, I really appreciated how you stressed um, when Jacob was a perio devtes, how it was this combination of a lack of ecclesiastical authority because he was pretty low on the totem pole and just had to do whatever the bishop kind of told him to do, but that also afforded a close connection with people that a bishop might not have had. Um, and I'd never really thought about that tension as, as formative for that, that office. So um, I really appreciate that. Um, the question I, I have, um, it's admittedly kind of vague, so forgive me. Um, I'm, I'm really struck both with the stuff I was thinking about last month and what you've brought up here about this, um, this tension between um, traditionality and originality in Jacob. On the one hand, he seems so formed by other things, some that we can see. For example, you highlighted Theodore's emphasis on education, which clearly is formative for Jacob. Um, and then there are formative influences that we, we can't see, such as um, his proemia. Clearly, he's, he's learned something somewhere, how to build these proemia, because it is so formulaic. And I guess my question is, um, do you think, and I, I'm taking it for granted that Jacob is kind of unique, like his proemia are very different from Narsai's proemia. I think I could be wrong. Do you think Jacob is just, um, is just truly unique in the way he has taken some kind of formation, which is available to a lot of people and developed it into a really um, unique, let's say piece of art, which is the Jacobian Mimra or do you think he's a representative of a tradition that we, we don't have as much evidence of? Do you think there are somewhere there were people that composed these long ornate proemia and we just, we just have Jacobs? Um, I guess, yeah, how do you, how representative of a tradition is Jacob and how much is he generally taking these formative influences but developing them into something new? Sorry, that's kind of a huge ambiguous <laughs> question, but. Uh, something your talk made me think of. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, I, 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 I would think of Jacob as quite unique. Um, we do not have the same type of uh, premia as uh, Jacob, and probably because he had because uh, of um, the way he envisions um, the, his work or his position more precisely as a, as a, as a preacher. So for the question of um, inspiration is central to him. He is both a preacher and a poet. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm not sure that in Greek or Latin tradition, for instance, we will have the same type of um, proemia. But even in Syriac, although, of course, the culture was common, uh, probably a part of the education, 
um, Narsai as uh, Jacob and Philoxenus probably learned how to write um, um, numerae mm -hmm. uh, in, in schools, just as uh, writers in ancient times learned how to write um, uh, discourses. Mm -hmm. So there, there probably was a, a, a Christian training in those three schools in Edessa as elsewhere in the monasteries, because of course they had to preach a lot each week, several, several times a week. And so um, they probably learned at school, but also trained on the spot, sometimes writing entirely the meme race, sometimes having just a kind of canvas on which they would um, um, extemporize. Uh, or some of them may be just um, entirely um, made uh, um, on the spot. And so uh, Jacob probably had, um, uh, well, he had a, 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 a knowledge of the Bible, mm -hmm. which he perhaps knew by heart. Mm -hmm. I, I met a monk in, in Lebanon who knew the Bible by heart. And not only that, but uh, he memorized the chapters and, and verses of the passages uh, during, um, uh, during the offices. Mm -hmm. And so it was quicker to ask him for a reference when we were working on, on Syriac manuscripts than going to an online tool. Mm -hmm. And so I found it really interesting because that is nowadays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so at the time when people didn't have many books, mm -hmm. they would, of course, um, learn by heart a lot. Mm -hmm. And we, we know that from uh, a number of uh, uh, Syriac texts. And so probably uh, Jacob did the same. He, he knew probably the Bible almost by heart, as well as um, maybe Ephraim's uh, uh, works. And so um, he both used formulaic ex um, expressions that were easy to um, to use in the context of, of the um, examiner of his memory, but at the same time, he uses them differently each time. And it's the same for the images coming from the Bible. In, he, he, he loves some passages more than others, mm -hmm. but in the different memory, he doesn't use those passages the same way. Mm -hmm. He adapts them to the context. Mm -hmm. and. He has different interpretations in the different memory. So he has his own um, intertextual um, um, composition, which makes him quite unique. And that is true also for, for that is true for the poemia as well as the um, memory as such. And so I'm, I'm not sure that he's representative of a, a tradition. He is in the in the sense that. Um, he was trained like other uh, 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 speakers, um, other clerics. He knew the Bible like uh, most of the faithful, uh, and probably better, of course. Mm -hmm. He read a, a number of um, commentaries and probably knew some of them by heart, and especially he knew. Uh, he, he read a new Ephraim, because you, you can see how um, his own poetry is uh, indebted to, to um, Ephraim's one. Um, but at the same time, he did something uh, quite, um, quite unique. And the number of his memory, as, as well as the size and the content, mm -hmm. is not comparable to uh, any other um, um, writer uh, in the Syriac tradition, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. E even if he has a lot in common with Narsa, also, for instance. Right. right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Philip? Yes, thank you, Muriel, so much for your talk. Um, I learned quite a lot from this, and um, I'm excited to look at these texts with fresh eyes now. Um, I have two questions, one's more specific and one's more general. Um, the first is, I was really happy that you engaged this homily on the Dormition. Um, I've been puzzled a bit myself by the, um, by the title that's given to it in the manuscript, this 81st Festo mm. Mimra, and <laughs> where that could possibly come from, 
And so my more specific question to that Namra is whether, as you read through it, if you saw signs that could confirm this context that's given in the title. I, I tend to be skeptical of these um, in, in other cases. I think there's one or two Jacob's first or last homily um, where um, I'm a bit more skeptical, but this one's so specific that <laughs> I'm intent, I, I don't know why else they would say this particular context. So um, that's my more specific question. Perhaps I'll leave it there for the sec for a moment. Yeah, I, um, uh, it's difficult to know what uh, uh, to um, what to think about uh, this introduction because, as you say, it's very specific. But at the same time, it's not surprising if it really happened that it was, um, you know, written down. Um, the context is likely, because mm -hmm. uh, as I said, um, um, Mariology was a, an important issue in the discussions with uh, the, um, uh, the Nestorians. Uh, and, and so um, the idea that a Mayaphysite was invited by a Mayaphysite congregation in Nisibis to give a talk at a time when the Church of the East convened a, a synod about uh, the Virgin mm -hmm. is quite interesting. Yeah. And uh, the Nimro itself was a kind of answer sent to uh, the, the Nestorians. Mm. So it's likely, but I cannot say more than that. We can see that Jacob was very much interested in the woman Persian relations. Mm -hmm. He received those letters from the, the faithful of Harzon. He wrote about um, um, the, the, the war, the Persian uh, Roman war. He was well informed about, um, uh, so, uh, well, you can see that he, he was aware of Zoroastrianism and its traditions. And so he may uh, have had an interest of what was going on on the other side of the, of, of the border. And of course, we always imagine borders as, uh, you know, closed and, and, and passable. And most of the time, it's not the case. We know of exchanges, uh, and not only during periods of, uh, of war. But of course, we have no means to, to be sure that it, um, it actually uh, happened. But I cannot imagine why somebody would forge an introduction like that with so much detail. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and my more um, general question is going right to what you're talking about with um, what I really appreciate at the beginning of your talk was this um, historical depiction of Jacob's um, letters that go to Persia, as well as the, um, the two homilies related to Amida. So, um, um, the cities that were in that um, border region. And um, as far as I, I'm very invested in finding ways to um, contextualize Jacob's works historically, um, and especially mm. homilies. And I'm wondering if, um, I was wondering where you would go with your talk, which homily you would work on next, um, in addition to your previous work. And I'm wondering how you would think of that, is there a method that we could take to find homilies that will lend themselves to this interpretation? Or is this something that comes up just by coincidence, we find these common themes that, that work well together? Um, how would, how should we um, proceed in further trying to contextualize Jacob's homilies? Probably by reading all of Jacob uh, homilies, um... <laughs> From the beginning to end, and probably several times, because it, it, I think that's uh, how you you uh, can make um, uh, uh, links between between them and and try to see a, a, a broader picture. I hadn't realized that myological uh, um, uh, arguments were that important. Mm -hmm. Neither that uh, it was in a, a memory about. Um, the nativity and, 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 and Mary, that we have information about the importance of the, uh, of the word, because of course it's Christ incarnated, so it's not surprising, but at the same time, I had not, never realized that before, um, you know, 
reading a lot uh, of Jacob's uh, memory. So the new edition by uh, um, Roger Akras is a, a wonderful opportunity to, to find uh, new homilies that can shed some light on, on this uh, historical uh, context. Uh, the, the one I, I translated about uh, the transformation of a, uh, the church uh, of St. Stephen in uh, Amida into a fire temple is quite striking uh, on, on that ground. You wouldn't have imagined something like, like that be, before um, you know uh, his uh, memoir uh, was published. So um, yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I cannot really answer your question. No, thank you. Any question about that? Thank you, Philip. Susan? First, I want to join by thanking you as others have, because this was a really wonderful, wonderful presentation, very rich with uh, a deep knowledge and also um, uh, shining lights of insight. And I just wanted to uh, ask about one point. You, you did such a wonderful job with the proemia, um, which are a real fascination to me. And uh, you did a wonderful job drawing out these different meanings of word and word and preaching and teaching kinds of authorities that joined, he brought together uh, at the moment of preaching them. One of the things that strikes me about these proemia, not only these proemia, but especially there is his intersection with words of singing, which also um, of course go right through the Mimra in terms of uh, when biblical figures speak, they often sing and in, in Jacob, interchanges the vocabulary of singing and the vocabulary of, of speaking. And I wondered if you would comment on that. Well, um, I think that it has to do with the way uh, Jacob understands um, um, uh, understands the, the, the liturgy. Uh, with his uh, physical dimension. I, I, I mentioned the fact that uh, this, he, he evokes the, 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 the 10 senses, mm -hmm. but that is really important because the five external senses and especially the sense of hearing um, opens to the um, inside uh, senses. And so um, the, the, the sound, whether the sound of words or, the, or even more the sound of uh, music, um, is not only um, something pleasant to the ear, but it's a, a way of engaging um, the, the, whole, um, the whole body and mind and intellect. And at the same time, uh, Jacob himself wrote uh, Mimre, which were poetry. Yeah. And poetry means music, music of the words. And when he says uh, um, in, in one of the texts I, I, I quoted that uh, he asked he asked God to give him uh, words, sounds, and music. Um, it's not just the hymns that were sung in the, in the church, but his own memory understood, understood as a, a, a form of music, the music of words with a, a rhyme and, and, and um, uh, um, artistry. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. Any other questions? Muriel, thank you again for this wonderful talk. Uh, it was wonderful, we were all clapping for you. Thank you. Uh, before we adjourn, I would like to remind you that our next speaker is Manolis Papoutsakis. He will deliver his paper entitled From Jacob of Saruk to Romanos on Wednesday, May 19th, 2021. And Rodrigue Constantine will deliver his second talk on John of Apameya tomorrow, April 22nd at 11 a.m. Washington DC time. His second talk is entitled Psychology, Therapy and Moral Growth. 
For more information, please visit thehiddenpearl.org. Thank you for joining us. We will see you. In